Christina. Hey, congratulations on your new documentary, Undivide Us. Thank you so much. I'm so excited that <laughs> people like it. <laughs> Such a timely uh, documentary, especially during an election year like, like this. But uh, we have to hear it first is uh, what actually sparked you to do this documentary in the first place? Well, I don't know about you, but I have definitely had a lot of those experiences where you um, are seeing people being crazy on Facebook or, um, you know, you're at dinner and um, you hear people are really scared to talk to each other about the issues that they care the most about. And I got, I was a journalist um, before I started making documentaries and I got really worried about what did this mean about what kind of world we we're going to leave for our kids to grow up into. So I started doing some research and um, came to find out that, um, we actually, there's a lot of amazing data that shows that Americans are not as crazy, toxically polarized as the media and the politicians would have us think. And so I wanted to make a documentary kind of explaining and exploring and digging into what that actually looks like um, uh, on the ground. So that's, that's, that's kind of what got me going on it, is to try to like save, save the future for my children. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that uh, you you went with the political route because uh, toxic polarization isn't just political. It, it it goes to it goes across the board in any type of things now these days. Uh, you know, sports, entertainment, and and politics. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. Um, it does go all over. I think um, the politics part. You know, I started working on this. Um, we actually made this documentary really quickly. I started, we started principal photography just a little over a year ago. Um, but I made it thinking I wanted it to be out for the full year before the election because I felt like last time we had an election in this country, it just felt like it was ramping up and up and up. And where I was living, people ended up feeling really, really hopeless and upset um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and so I wanted to help, I wanted to offer um, some content that could give people hope about their local communities, about how they could engage. And um, so that's why I went the political route. But I agree, you know, the humanization that we talk about in the documentary is applicable across so many topics today. Like, you're exactly right. So, so how did you come across this uh, group study, this organization that was actually looking into it? Did they, did you... Did, did you know about them doing this study or they created the study for your documentary? So what happened is I read a book by a guy kind of as I started looking into this, I read a book by a guy named Tony Woodley and the book was called I Citizen. And in the book, he posited that this toxic polarization that we all think is all around us is actually a myth. And that the vast majority of us can have these conversations. And so I was like, well, that's really interesting. Um, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a political scientist, but I am a, I'm a filmmaker. So what if I went around the country showcasing people having these conversations about the issues that we think are the most toxic in our, in our country, you know, abortion, immigration, the elections, you know, all these things that really kind of have these emotional responses in people. Um, and then, so I worked with Tony on that. And then I worked with this other guy named Ben Clutzi, who is the head of the Mercatus Center. And he runs a whole like workshop on pluralism. And he's just also like mad smart. So he knew about like all the different studies and the academics and how we could weave that in. Um, and so we just, we did focus groups around the country, um, you know, trying to get people to kind of, uh, both showcase how strongly they felt about things, but also like recognize the humanity in one another. And so um, that's that's kind of how the whole thing <laughs> got started and, and where we ended up. And um, what we found was pretty surprising too. You know, people don't change their minds about anything, basically. <laughs> you know, people come in on their different sides and they leave on their different sides but they do change their mind about how they feel about people on the other side, which is, I actually think, really important for us. That that's the lesson to take away, is that we 
we really can recognize the humanity of people with whom we disagree with. And that is, that's exciting and really good. So during the, during the study, um, how did you recruit uh, the people to be part of this uh, focus group? I mean, who, who to actually choose? Yeah. So we worked with, we actually worked with a, a, a proper like focus group company. We hired them to help us make sure that we weren't falling into the same traps that I think a lot of content in this space unfortunately does. You know, we tend to recruit and talk to people who look and think like us. And that's actually not great. And if you want to do a documentary that's going to appeal to the broad swath of America, you know, the, the hundred or the hundred percent, you know, not, not a little, um, a, a little group of folks. So we, we looked for, um, we then asked them to find people that were reflective of the demographics of the populations that we were going to, you know, in terms of age, race, um, political, you know, uh, perspectives. And we had a harder time getting some folks than other folks. You know, we had a really hard time recruiting conservative women in Arizona, for example. But, you know, we we worked it until we could find somebody um, who was going to uh, represent that that perspective for the for the focus group. Now, of course, you know, you you chosen uh, quite a few people for this focus group, but uh... But as a doc as a documentarian, you only have so much time um, in your film. So, how did you choose specifically on who to follow? Mm. So we we had the conversations, um, you know, in in the bigger focus groups, and then I um, I went back to the edit room, you know, like you do, and you watch hours and hours of tape, and you're like, oh, I really think, you know. For example, I really thought the conversation around guns had some really interesting things that came out of it, right? Like we had um, two characters, Matt and Salisha, sitting next to each other. Matt, who is, you know, a gun Second Amendment like advocate, and Salisha, who we didn't know this coming to the focus group, but whose child's father had been killed by gun violence the month before. Like we didn't know that was actually there. But um, once and, and they actually had started developing this like friendship then in the pre and post like conversations that happened from the focus group. And so um, I followed up with them to say like, hey, can we follow, you know, you um, and, 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 and talk a little bit deeper. Um, that, that was kind of how, how it evolved was just to kind of see what organically was happening and then and then dive in on on places where we felt like um, both there would be kind of interest because there was this kind of the tension that we that we that we find on on the national level, but then also like where where those those pieces where you find these like interesting sparks of humanity that actually kind of organically happen. So that that was the process, but it was a lot of watching a lot of focus group video, which. I would not highly recommend to anyone. <laughs> People <laughs> always say, can we see the unedited version? I'm like, I don't think you want to. <laughs> <laughs> now, now get, getting these, uh, these folks here to be uh, on camera, um, did it, did they, were they aware that they're part of a focus group and a documentary or did you have to uh, convince them to be part of the documentary and, and so on? No, we went into this. They knew. They knew from the get go. Um, I mean, and I think it's it's actually it's very unusual to film a focus group the way that we did, the way that we kind of we set it up. I was really conscious about um, if you if you when you see the documentary, you'll see that like we filmed it at a table so that people were comfortable. Um, uh, there's a lot of content in this space where people are kind of sitting on stools, and I every time I watch something like that, I was kind of like those people inherently don't look comfortable. I don't believe that they're going to like feel like they can really speak their minds. And, you know, you want to, you want to relax on some level and be yourself. Um, so I tried to create a, um, as much as I could. I mean, it's still hard when you have like five cameras around you all, all rolling um, and all the lights and everything. But I, um, 
I tried to create a, an atmosphere where people would feel like they could be authentic. Um, and so we did everything like little things like when they came in, we tried to have like nice snacks and like relaxing things and introduce people, you know, just things to try to help people be be their true selves. Because I think that that's that makes for the best content, most relatable um, creates that that audience, you know, heart connection, which is which is what I'm always looking for. Now, speaking of true selves, because I always oftentimes find polarization usually occurs on social media behind, you know, behind a screen, you know, on, on a keyboard. And people are different when when they're faced with cameras in their faces. Don't are are, are you are, are you aware of that or you, you believe that that's not necessarily the case? Oh, no, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I mean, when we are our we are our worst selves and listen to our our most terrible angels, right? Like the devil on your shoulder, right? When when we have that anonymity of of, of social media. But I actually think that the remedy for that is for us to really be super conscious about what we are cultivating in the world. You know, people ask me, people will ask me, um, you know, are you saying that this is the media's fault? And I'm like, I'm always like, yes, and your fault. You know, it's, it's upon, it's incumbent upon us to be really conscious consumers of all these social media and con unconscious perpetrators, you know, when we think about what we're going to put, put out into the world. And that doesn't mean that we have to muzzle ourselves, but I think that when we are casting aspersions on the other side, and you'll see in the film, there are some like, some really toxic tweets that we put up of, of like examples of how how hateful people are about people with whom they disagree. That's like also the, the part where I want people to just say, hold on a second. Is, is there some other explanation why someone could have a, an opinion that's different from my own that isn't that they are a horrible, hateful person who isn't worthy of the benefits of citizenship? You know, like, I think that we have got to put the brakes on on that mentality. Um, and, and social media is the first place to do it. So I agree with you completely. Um, uh, yeah. So as, as, a, as a fly on the wall during these uh, studies, what surprised you the most? Yeah. One of the things that surprised me the most was um, uh, like one of my producers had done a lot of kind of focus group work in the past. And and she and I both didn't anticipate that the people would want to keep the conversations going. Like we would have the focus group piece and then they would want to like hang out and talk to each other and they're exchanging emails. And what she said is that mostly when people are done with the focus group, they like want to check and want to get out of there, you know, but our people weren't like that. It was like their hearts had been opened and they wanted to just keep talking to one another and we were like no we've got another folks group coming in you you gotta you gotta get out um but it was actually so dramatic that then we started filming it because we thought this is a really interesting phenomena in terms of how people kind of almost felt like it was um it was like cathartic to feel like they could step into these conversations and not be yelled at or judged poorly and um i think it really shows that there's a there's a hunger for this in this country, you know, for for engagement, for civil engagement, where you don't have to worry about somebody jumping down your throat. Um, I, I think most Americans are good people and, and, and want that, you know, but we just have to remind ourselves that that is who we are, actually, <laughs> not not this, you know, caricature that has been has been sold up to us. So so are you saying you luckily had all these focus groups and there were actual no real clashes, no extremists in, in these focus groups at, at all. I, I, I will let you watch the video gig. <laughs> there, there, there were no, cause I honestly, I would have, I would have felt like it was journalistically like necessary to include it. If, if we had had a, a, a big conflict, um, I, I would have, I would have put it in context, you know, because that's that's what I think we do is as as responsible purveyors and storytellers. But um, I would have absolutely included it. 
Um, and, you know, we have dozens of focus group people out there. <laughs> None of them are going to come back and say, oh, well, I had a big fighting. I'm not worried about that because it just didn't happen. You know, um, they were, um, they didn't agree with each other. They, But that wasn't the point. The point wasn't to get them to like move to the center and sing Kumbaya together. The point was to say, can we engage as citizens and be okay? Like, is civil war the answer or is like is there a framework that we can do this as as citizens in this country and i think the answer was a resounding yes and that's why i'm it's funny i've been doing screenings around the country people feel so excited when they see the film also because i think they just they they want to they want to they do the same thing that the focus group did they want to like stand around and talk to each other and be like oh did you see this and that reminded me of this and I mean, people, people get engaged and I'm, that's, to me, that's the point. Well said. And, and Christy, what is up next for you after this, you know, as a journalist and documentarian? <laughs> I have to get through the end of this year first, <laughs> you know, get through the election and get through all the screenings of this film, which are, is really wonderful. I am working on another project, um, called a uh, rash for america which is really exciting um it's about uh they're inviting they have outfitters from around the country that are inviting people from the right and the left to go whitewater rafting together <laughs> and make sure they don't all drown <laughs> so that's that's exciting too <laughs> well let me wrap it up with one, one last question with you christy is um as audiences uh what have a chance to watch your film undivide us what is the one most important take you hope they walk away with? Mm, I hope I hope that they take the advice that's given from one of our experts, which is seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Like if we do that a little bit more in this country, I think we might just uh, save the country for our kids. Well said, well said, well. Christy, thank you very much uh, for carrying this conversation for Undivide Us. Um, it surprised me on how civil we could actually be, but then it always come back to the thought that, you know what, when it comes down to it, like if we get drafted for uh, for jury duty, we will always be civil in those type of situations. So thank you very much. So true, so true. Thank you so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate you. Thanks for watching. Hey, thank you.